I had to monitor my behavior to avoid giving boys the wrong idea. I could have funded my law school education. During my tenure as a pom-pom dancer, I was reminded to tone it down so I wouldn't be seen as dumb or easy. But then in law school, I was told to perk it up so I wouldn't be seen as an aggressive bitch. While I was mindful of these after-school special warnings, as a child of the 80s, I believed that women could do and have it all, and that as an adult, the stigma around either too little or too much sexuality would disappear. Walking into law school with my big hair and my shoulder pads, I was confident that because I was smart and capable. The whole good girl, bad girl thing would go away. And I would no longer have the extra burden of trying to make sure that I wasn't giving people, <coughs> men, the wrong idea. When it came time for my first case as a student attorney, I couldn't have been happier or more confident. I was wearing my new navy blue business suit that I had gotten for Christmas. My permed hair was clipped up on the sides and then tied together down low with a conservative black scrunchie. And I had done some killer research. I was, as they say, so on fire that I won my case in the first five minutes. So when the judge called me into his chambers, I was certain that I would be lauded for my performance and my potential. But the judge said nothing of my performance or my potential. Instead, he talked about my legs, too nice, my smile, too much, and my hair. Had I ever considered wearing an ala? <sighs> Mortified, I walked away feeling incapable as an attorney, devalued as a person, I'm like I had done something wrong. It took me almost 25 years to understand what had happened that day, to realize I wasn't the one who had done anything wrong. And how, in that moment, I wasn't being seen for the skills that I had, the results that I produced, or even for my desire to create justice in the world. Instead, I was being evaluated and then dismissed by a judge based on his interpretation of my sexuality and what he thought I was capable of because of it. Whoa, do you know what's crazier than that though? The way I believed his judgment. As a society, collectively and then individually, we judge women based on our interpretation of their sexuality and what they must be like or capable of because of it. Have we made progress? Yes, we've made a lot of progress. But while there's less overt discrimination against women, the covert virgin whore dichotomy and the judgment around that is alive and well and running in the background. And nobody talks about it. The virgin whore dichotomy is the belief that women are either virtuous and good or promiscuous and bad. And we judge women according to that continuum. But as women, we don't talk about it. We've internalized the stigma and the shame around those labels. So when we get judged, 
we're silent because we think we are the ones who have done something wrong. While standards have changed some since our mothers or our grandmother's generation, the individual stigma around female sexuality has not. An example is when Janet Jackson showed her pasty-covered nipple during the Super Bowl halftime show, the FCC received nearly half a million complaints. But when Adam Levine showed his entire torso, including both fully uncovered nipples, they got around 55. Once again, in 2020, there was a flurry of complaints around J-Lo and Shakira's too sexy halftime because they performed <gasps> on a pole. What do you remember about that halftime? Their performance or the controversy? These two multi-talented Latino moms were not judged on their talent or their skill or their intention to create a show of strength and unity for women of all ages and ethnicities. No, no, no. They were judged on the virgin whore continuum and their performance dismissed because of it. Now, some people complained that the show was too sexy because stripping was inappropriate for children. But no stripping took place. There was just a pole. Looking at a pole from a child's point of view probably equates to something other than stripper, which is an example of how we deem sexuality and self-expression as either appropriate or inappropriate based on the male gaze of how we make decisions about a woman's potential, suitability, and even executive presence based on what a straight man might find sexy. And then how we perpetuate the belief that the judgment around a woman's sexuality somehow matters. While I can only speak from my perspective as a white, cisgendered, heterosexual woman, and I recognize that it's even more complicated for women who are not white or who face other forms of marginalization, what I can speak to is how too many of us have had our opportunities and choices limited based on covert discrimination with regards to our sexuality. So how did we get here? Well, let's start with the foundation, patriarchy and puritanism. Oxford languages defines patriarchy as a system of government where men hold the primary power and women are largely excluded from it. While patriarchy is at the root of so much oppression, it's the interplay of patriarchy and Puritanism that's important to deconstruct here. Puritanism refers to the beliefs of the 16th and 17th century pilgrims who believed in piety and purity and that sex, while good, should only take place within marriage. For reference, think about the book The Scarlet Letter, where Hester Prime is forced to wear a scarlet letter A for adultery on her chest so everyone can identify and then shun her more easily. Those are the Puritans. Even though the settling of Plymouth Rock was a long time ago, a study in the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology found that contemporary Americans were still implicitly influenced by traditional Puritan values with regards to sex. Even though, according to Gallup polls, on a societal level, we become more comfortable with things like premarital sex every year, Individually, we remain uncomfortable with women we think are not pious or pure enough. Which is also kind of ironic, because we're also uncomfortable with women we think are too pious and pure. In 1998, the US Supreme Court held one of our major accounting firms liable for sex discrimination against Anne Hopkins 
who was denied partnership despite outperforming her male coworkers. The reason? Lack of conformity to gender stereotypes. Translation, she wasn't sexy enough. Well, according to the men that she worked for, she was told that she needed to walk, talk, and dress more femininely, to wear makeup, style her hair, and even consider wearing jewelry. Now, even though this case was a long time ago, a 2021 Forbes article entitled Gender Discrimination is Still Alive and Well in the Workplace detailed a similar situation showing that gender stereotyping and being sexy enough still matters. But on the flip side, a 2019 study published in the Sex Rules Journal found that attractive business women were seen as less trustworthy than regular women. Well, whereas for men, appearance made no difference. Aptly referred to as the femme fatale effect, this study illustrates the culturally ingrained and unconscious bias we have against women perceived as being too sexy. Now for clarity, a femme fatale is a dangerous and a seductive woman who ensnares others with her charms leading them to despair and destruction. Which means, in addition to conforming to gender stereotypes and being sexy enough to promote, we must also make sure that we're not too sexy or we won't be trusted. This isn't just a workplace problem either. It impacts our girls as well. A 2019 article in the Journal of Gender Studies on gender, sexting, and the teenage years noted that it was a much bigger deal for a girl to send a nude than it was for a boy because the social consequences were more damaging for a girl. Now, not that any of us want our teenagers sexting or sending nudes, but why the double standard? The result of these conflicting directives and outdated ideologies is a narrow range of behavior that keeps women striving for the elusive and impossible balance of being sexy enough to maintain power and position in the patriarchy while not being too sexy. These culturally ingrained forces put women and those identifying as women in a double bind with regards to authentic self-expression. We either limit ourselves to the narrow range of acceptable behavior, dress, and life choices, and reap the rewards, or we express the full range of all that we are and risk being cast as the proverbial whore, the stereotypical prude, and denied. Contrary to what I originally first thought, what happened to me that day in the judge's chambers was not unique. Women are judged and shamed around their sexuality all the time. It's so common that oftentimes we don't even see it because it's in our language. Men are players. Women are skanky hoes. We have tramp stamps. Men just have tattoos. Women with children either have mom bods or are MILFs, a crude acronym for moms I'd love to. Mm -hmm. And because it's so common, too many of us, irrespective of our race, our gender, or our sexual orientation, are complicit in maintaining and enforcing this kind of thinking. Thinking that impacts and limits the opportunities and the choices women make every day. In order for a woman to be judged on her merits, for her to keep the rights and privileges she's entitled to and has earned, she must first seek to manage your perception of where she falls on the virgin whore continuum. That's a problem. Have you ever looked a woman up and down and thought, oh honey, I would not be wearing that if I were you. How about 
buttoned up your shirt, covered a tattoo, or put on glasses when you wanted to be taken seriously. That's the problem. Imagine a world where phrases like, who are you trying to impress dressed like that? Or, you're going to give people the wrong idea. We're obsolete. Imagine a world where if a judge inappropriately chastised a young attorney for her appearance, the judge's support staff would call him out. <laughs> or better yet, a world where a young female attorney would feel safe enough to speak up on her own behalf to remind that judge that her hairstyle, legs, and smile had nothing to do with her ability to successfully practice law. Now is the time to challenge our outdated and harmful assumptions and the behaviors that proceed from them around female sexuality. The path forward begins with all of us noticing and calling out judgments or assumptions made about a woman that have nothing to do with her skills or abilities. For women, it involves boldly owning your virgin, your whore, and everything in between, which is just a fancy way of saying, show up. It's the fully embodied badass that you are. Wear hair, makeup, and clothing that makes you comfortable and happy. Honor and enjoy your body, no matter what your age, your size, or your condition, and speak your truth without explanation, apology, or justification. And most importantly, let go of the idea that you can control the way other people perceive you because you can't. And instead of pandering to judgment, advocate on your own behalf and champion other women to do the same. For those who don't identify as women, do your part to normalize a full range of female self-expression, which means call out things like sexist dress codes, stereotypical standards regarding executive presence, and comments made about the tone or the quality of a woman's voice Help women advocate on their own behalf by believing instead of belittling their experience. And most importantly, be accountable for your own attitudes and beliefs around women you think are either too sexy or too plain. And instead of taking advantage, take the lead and help us all break down stigma and stereotype. I've given you the opportunity to know me today as a lawyer, a speaker, and an advocate for women. Your opinion probably doesn't change if I let you know that I'm also a coach for women recovering from betrayal, a mom of two amazing 20-something sons, and a wife. But as your opinion of me and my capabilities evolve, as I let you know that in my mid-40s, I started dancing burlesque, that I have disrobed and unapologetically shared my mom vibe on stage. Be honest with yourself. How did your opinion just change? What thoughts? or assumptions popped into your head. That judgment is what we need to change. Thank you.